Welcome to Teacher Tom Hanoi. This is a mock IELTS listening exam. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. I repeat, all the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Good luck. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a university staff member and two students. One of the students wants to register for a student discount card. First, you will have some time to look at questions one to three. Hi, excuse me. I want to register to get a student discount card. Do you know if I can do that here at the library? Right. No, there's a special office you have to go to for that. Okay, that's what I thought. Do you know where I need to go? Hmm. Yes, but unfortunately it's not here. Do you know where the student union is? It's in there. There's a big conference on there this week, though, so it might be very busy. If I were you... I'd go as early as you can before it gets busy in that part of town. All right, that's good advice. I don't actually know where the student union is. What's the best way to get there? Are you travelling by bus or metro? Actually, I was planning to go on foot. I've got my bike with me and I'm not sure if I can take it on public transport. You can take your bike on the metro between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Catching the bus would be quicker, though. Right, I'll have my bike so that won't work. I'll have to take the metro. Okay. It's a bit slower, but pretty easy from here. What you need to do is walk down the hill to the bridge, and you'll see a metro station just opposite the supermarket. Parkway station? Yeah. Catch the metro there, the green line, and go two stops to Westfield Station. Get off there, and it's a short walk to the university campus. The student union is on the main road just after West Grove. The office for discount cards is on the top floor but you have to make an appointment at the reception, just next to the main entrance on the ground floor. Right. I'll head there now. Thanks for your help. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I want to register for a student discount card. Certainly. Are you a full-time student? Yes, I am. OK. I'll have to take down some details. What's your name? Matt. That's spelt with a double T. Baker. Matt Baker. Is that B-A-K-E-R? Yes, that's right. What's your address? Flat 6, 12 Smith Street. Smith Street. OK. And which town is that? That's in Hartley. H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. Postcode? Sorry? Which postcode is Hartley in? Oh, um, it's, uh, let me think. H-R-4, oh no, sorry, um, I mean H-R-5-3-S-D. H-R-4-3-S-D? No, it's H-R-5. Ah, right, got it. And what's your date of birth? 21st of May, 1995. And your phone number, please? 08417-372-725. Thanks. Now, you need to take this form with your personal details to the office to be photocopied, along with your ID and details of your course. Right. Where is the office? Just next door. Oh, and you'll also need proof of your address. Oh, I didn't know that. W will any letter addressed to me be okay? No, I'm afraid not. You'll need to bring a utility bill. You can't get a card without it. Right, I see. Well, thanks very much. I'll come back another time, then. That is the end of Part 1. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to Part 1.
Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio presenter talking about seals. First, you will have some time to look at questions, 11 to 15. It's our pleasure to announce the guest of our show today, Amy Jackson, who's representing the Seal Conservation Trust. Amy, let's talk about the Trust. As the name implies, the main purpose of our Trust is defending seals in seas all across the globe. We strive to inform the public about the suffering that these marine creatures are going through as a result of pollution and other dangers. The Trust was founded a decade ago, and it's now among the most rapidly evolving animal charities nationwide. Even though it remains somewhat minor in relation to the major actors in animal protection, our efforts in education are our greatest pride. Past year, we travelled to numerous schools throughout the country, making trips to speak with kids and youngsters between the ages of 4 and 18. Nearly 37% of our members are actually children. The Foundation uses its resources to finance campaigns, such as the ones that advocate revisions in the fisheries policy and similar initiatives. Our Trust looks forward to hiring its first dedicated biologist, an expert on seals, to keep watch over populations. Needless to say, many individuals provide their services as volunteers, and people currently volunteer for us as observers, office workers, and in other capacities. The award recognising our efforts in education that we are granted by the Charity Commission the previous year is also worth mentioning. It hasn't meant big money for us, but it has brought even more publicity and recognition to our efforts. It's hard to say whether this will motivate more members to join in the long run, although we certainly wish to see this effect. Now, we actually run a massive project in the east of Scotland, because hardly any shipping goes on there. This area has long served as a refuge for seals. Sadly, oil companies are looking to expand their activities in the area, affecting its fauna as a result. We're opposing this in our campaigns for a reason, even though the pollution from oil won't be significant, the exploration results in huge amount of underwater noise. Seals can neither rest nor socialise in such conditions. This is how I became interested in seal conservation in the first place. At school, I had no strong interest in seals. I hadn't even seen one by then. Later, a story came to my attention. It was about a child running a campaign to save the family of seals that the oil companies forced to flee from their home in the Moray Firth. I was so touched that I couldn't stop reading the book. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you will have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. I've no doubt that the listeners of our show will want to know how they can be of help. You referred to the Adopt a Seal program. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. It allows people to decide which one of their seals they would like to sponsor. We send them a picture of the seals and provide them with news updates. At the moment, four seals are being adopted by the members of our trust. Their names are Crush, Simba, Fluke and Rudder. Much to our regret, Simba is being hard to spot this year and our observers haven't yet been able to locate him. We still hope that Simba will eventually show up though. As for the other seals, they've been very sociable. Fluke and Rudder are often possible to take a photo of together. And Crush is our true celebrity because she seems to enjoy coming near the cameras and we photographed her countless times. Each seal has its own personality. 
Fluke moves with a lot of grace, coming out and into the water in a very smooth fashion, while Rudder is full of beans. Whenever he jumps out of the water, he has lots of vigour. One would think that Rudder is the youngest seal we have, but it's not the case. Crush is the youngest of them, and Rudder is the most recent seal that we have selected for the programme. Crush is usually easy to spot since she is very loud. Fluke and Simba make a lot of sound too, but Fluke is easy to locate for another reason. The fin on her back is especially large and it's hard not to notice. As you see, they're all unlike each other. They definitely seem to be one charming crew. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a tutor and a student about ethical hacking. First, you will have some time to look at questions, 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions, 21 to 24. Right, Louisa. You are going to begin this week's seminar for us with a summary of your reading of ethical hacking. That's right. Great. Shall we start with a definition? How would you define ethical hacking? Right. Well, we hear about hacking on the news all the time. From fake news to service attacks to data breaches. It seems like the bad guys are always causing trouble. And it's true, the bad guys are doing all kinds of damage, from the annoying spam in the email box to the destructive cyber attacks that steal personal data, or worse. But there are good guys with the same skills, and they are the ethical hackers. But what is ethical hacking exactly? An ethical hacker also known as a white hat hacker, is the ultimate security professional. Ethical hackers know how to find and exploit vulnerabilities and weaknesses in various systems, just like a malicious hacker or a black hat hacker. In fact, they both use the same skills. However, an ethical hacker uses those skills in a legitimate lawful manner to try to find vulnerabilities and fix them before the bad guys can get there and try to break in. An ethical hacker's role is similar to that of a tester, but it involves broader duties. They break into systems legally and ethically. This is the primary difference between ethical hackers and real hackers, the legality. Right, so it's an individual who is usually employed by an organisation and who can be trusted to undertake an attempt to penetrate networks and or computer systems using the same methods as a malicious hacker. Exactly. The role of an ethical hacker is important since the bad guys will always be there trying to find cracks, backdoors, and other secret ways to access data they shouldn't. In fact, there's even a professional certification for ethical hackers. Apart from testing duties, do ethical hackers have other responsibilities? Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions, 25 to 30. The main idea 
is to replicate a malicious hacker at work, and instead of exploiting the vulnerabilities for malicious purposes, seek countermeasures to shore up the system's defenses. An ethical hacker might employ some strategies to penetrate a system, like scanning ports and seeking vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities with each of the ports can then be studied and remedial measures can be taken. Another more unusual strategy is social engineering concepts, like dumpster diving, rummaging through trash bins for passwords, charts, sticky notes, or anything with crucial information that can be used to generate an attack. Wow, that's an unusual job description. Yes, and there are more. An ethical hacker may also employ other social engineering techniques, like shoulder surfing, when they take a sneaky look over somebody's shoulder and look at the password they're typing onto the screen. For example, they might also play the kindness card to trick employees to part with their passwords. I suppose that detecting how well the organization reacts to these and other tactics help test the strength of the security policy and security infrastructure. Right. An ethical hacker attempts the same types of attacks as a malicious hacker would try, and then help organizations strengthen their defenses. While some may argue that there is no such thing as a good hacker, and all white hat hackers are actually bad hackers who have turned a new leaf, most people agree that the profession is here to stay. As with any profession, passion for the industry is one of the key aspects to success. This combined with a good knowledge of networking and programming will help a professional succeed in the ethical hacking field. How much can an ethical hacker expect to make? Well, that's an interesting question. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on the topic of food science. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last lecture in the series on food science, which, as you already know, is about the avocado. Let's start with a little history. On May 15th, 1915, in the posh new Hotel Alexandria in Los Angeles, a cadre of California farmers gathered to decide the fate of a new crop. The aguacate, a pebbly-skinned, pear-shaped fruit, had been the staple food in Mexico and Central and South America since 500 BC. In the 16th century, Spanish conquistadors fell in love with the fruit after observing its prized status among the Aztecs. Until the early 1900s, the aguacate had never been grown commercially in the United States. By 1914, however, hotels in Los Angeles and San Francisco were ordering as many of the fruits as they could and paying as much as $12 for a dozen. But the farmers faced a marketing problem. First, aguacate was too hard for Americans to pronounce. It also had another unappealing name, alligator pear. The farmers came up with a new name, avocado. They informed dictionary publishers of the change and named their own group the California Avocado Association. The approach worked. Today, California accounts for nearly 90% of all avocados grown in the United States. When the farmers first met, E.J. Wilson, a Berkeley horticulturalist, predicted little interest from the American market, saying that it contained no sugar and fruits were supposed to be sweet. The sweeter, the better. 
The farmers knew that Wilson's concerns were unfounded. What made the avocado so different from other fruits was the very reason it was appealing. Like most fruit, the avocado ripens once plucked from the tree, but its flesh is unlike any other, buttery, not sweet, somewhat nutty and oily in flavor. Firm enough to be sliced or diced, yet pliable enough to be mashed into paste or puree. There are more than 400 varieties of avocado, but Haas has become the most popular in the United States. Named after a postal worker, Rudolf Haas, who purchased the seedling in 1926 from a California farmer, the distinctive purplish black fruit has a thicker skin and smaller body than the other varieties. Farmers found the Haas easier to cultivate and its higher oil content and good nutty flavor appealed to customers. Avocados present a mouth-watering array of serving options. They can be sliced and served with apples, nuts and cheese. In their most popular form, guacamole, they are mashed with salt, lime, garlic, coriander, chilies and tomatoes, depending on the recipe. They can be fed to infants, and Indonesians blend them into drinks with sweet condensed milk. Brazilians add it to ice cream. Californians put it in their maki rolls. Avocados have a subtle nutty flavor, too subtle for some people to get excited about. But the beauty of avocados is not so much its flavor, but its oily consistency. Avocados have become popular in restaurants and homes because, in food science terms, they act as a covalent bond with other ingredients. The creaminess of the fruit converts disparate tastes into complementary ones and adds flavor to otherwise dull ingredients. Another way to think of avocado's role is to consider the fat marbling in a prime steak. Marbling is what makes a steak flavorful. Avocados with their natural fatty richness serve a similar purpose when incorporated with other foods. Mash an avocado with a pinch of salt and a drizzle of oil and you'll find it adds flavor to nearly any meal. That is the end of part four. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to part four. That is the end of the mock IELTS listening exam. You now have 10 minutes to review and transfer your answers from the exam paper to the answer sheet provided. Thank you for your attention. Let us know in the comments what score you got. Also, please like and subscribe for more mock IELTS exams. Thank you, and see you in the next video.